turn, angular turn. And it was in these 30 degree increments. Well, when I saw this device on a scrap heap in Albuquerque, I knew that's what it was. And I picked it up, and certainly the, the label on the back, on the side of it, showed that it was a PAL Talker Compass, and it came from, it was labeled KT small p large 2, KTP2, uh, manufactured by List on October the 10th, 1943. Uh, it was a guidance compass from a German 1943 vintage flying saucer. And now, what the device, and this was when I bought it, was in 1979. It was classified. So how did it get in this scrap heap? Soon after I got this device, the government apparently found out that I had it. So they went to the scrap dealer to find out how he got it. And the scrap dealer then said, I got it from a guy at Sandia Base. So they went, to the, the guy at Sandia Base was the guy who normally brought scrap released for salvage to him. This guy was stealing classified, he didn't know it was classified salvage when he stole it and sold it. And so they put him under surveillance, they caught him doing it again, and they put him in jail. And then that information got back to the scrap dealer and got back to me. So that was classified information. They weren't supposed to let that kind of information get out. The scrap dealer wasn't supposed to know it. I wasn't supposed to know it, but I know it. And I found it out, so I knew that they couldn't come and get this thing back from me without confirming what it was. And why was some, some device from 1943 still classified if it was That's nothing more than an inertial guidance system? That's a good point. If it's, if it's present on every airplane in the German uh, Air Force and it's present in every airplane... The dial is in the, in the middle on it, and it's clear that this device controls the direction of the flying saucer and that the saucer can turn in any of these 30-degree increments, just like the ones that I saw. But this one, uh, you feel, is, is different in that this, this would be for an airplane? Yeah, this would be for, for navigating, and what the purpose of this is is you're using an inertial guidance system or navigational system to maintain a true north heading so that you know what direction you're really going. Right. Uh, ordinary compass could be influenced by all sorts of things. Magnetic uh, uh, declination, uh, metal on the ship, electrical things can influence it. But on this device, it's strictly inertial. So when they take off, they calibrate the master compass. No matter which way the ship turns, it maintains its true heading in relation to this compass. And so they can always know what their heading is. Okay. with accuracy for navigational purposes. Um, also in this uh, wonderful uh, uh, junkyard that uh, uh, we were in, uh, <coughs> there's another piece of uh, salvage here called a Master Indicator Gyro Flux Gate Compass. Uh, do you see any relation between these two? Yeah, both of these more or less are the same thing. This is a World War II variety, and this is a later version, which you can see the jet plane on the pointer here, right. that this comes from the jet era. So... As best I can tell it, it may be made in the 50s, maybe 54, because of these numbers, in which case it, it's, it's definitely in the jet plane era. So it serves the same purpose. Yeah, and it's smaller, more compact. And this is a World War II version that was used to get a correct heading with an inertial compass. And so you have a, this is the master indicator, as it says on its, uh, it says master indicator. So this will give them a true heading for north, and then they can plan all of their navigation around that. They want to know where north is. So the technology they might have quelled from this type of knowledge of uh, uh, inertial guidance systems yeah. to, to use on but the But I type. think the device that I have, the Pile Doctor Compass, I believe that it originally was a Nikola Tesla invention that was that was developed in conjunction with, with Sperry Gyroscope Company in 1917 because there's a documentation in my book that Tesla tested a uh, a robotic plane on a round trip, uh, 200 miles round trip flight in conjunction with Sperry. And they so, mentioned the, the company name, Sperry. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, and, they do a uh, lot of... Uh, Elmer purpose. Sperry was an, a friend of Tesla's. Tesla apparently developed this friendship and, and, and used Sperry to develop this thing on this robotic ship that was flown on a 200 mile... It was taken off, landed... Uh, I mean, uh, taken off again and brought back uh, all robotically. And uh, it was the first flight of that type, uh, as far as I know. And I believe that because I found several other technologies that were properties of the Sperry 
gyroscope, later Sperry Unisys, which ended up in Nazi hands, there seemed to be a trading with the enemy thing going How on about there. That? And, for instance, the Klystron tube, which was developed by the Varian brothers in 1939, was a, a Sperry property. And, the, and researchers claim that the uh, Nazis had the Klystron tube and show diagrams of it in Nazi documents. So it looks like the Klystron found its way along with the so pile the, the Nazis, uh, or uh, The Nazis seem to have a uh, very good handle on uh, microwave technology. Um, well, the first the guy they sent over here in 1936, actually he was invited by the American Rocket Society and the National Geographic and the Smithsonian Institution and the Simon and Florence Guggenheim Foundation was a scientist, a rocket scientist named Billy Lay. And Lay was actually very, very the popular. tutor of Von Braun. Yes. And Lay came over here at the invitation of the American Rocket Society and all the rest to work with Goddard. Now, now, uh, what's the time period we're talking about here? 1936. Actually, he was invited around 1935, and he came over here, and he defected. There was research being done prior to 1935 on rocket technology yes. by uh, individuals other than John Goddard yes. here in this country. Paul uh, Robert Goddard. I'm sorry, and yes, and uh, there was uh, a rocket scientist who lived in Santa Fe from, I believe, the late 20s. Uh, I know he was here all during the 30s. And uh, many people know him as a solar designer because he built a lot of solar houses and this sort of thing and wrote some books on the subject. But he was a rocket scientist whose rockets were actually outperforming all the other rockets before, but he used solid fuel. His name was Peter Van Dresser, and he was the author of Peter of the Van Dresser Constant, which Von Braun talks extensively about when he talks about his plans uh, to go to the moon. And because the Van Dresser's Constant was used to, to uh, uh, compute the trajectory uh, of the rockets, and it was also used to fire all those rockets into Belgium and England. Let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, Werner Von Braun. Uh, his presence here in New Mexico uh, apparently goes back a little further than is widely understood. Yeah, this is all, this is all purged and, uh, and kept out of the books. Nobody's ever told about this. Right. But Van Dresser was angry because, with Goddard because Goddard worked originally, as I said, Lay was sent over here, but Lay defected. So they had to find a replacement, and they took young Von Braun and got him through his Ph.D. program and promoted him as the director of research for rocketry in Germany and uh, at the Pain Mundi project. And they promoted him up and sent him over to replace Lay because Lay married a Russian ballerina named Olga Feldman and took out American citizenship papers by 1937. But back in 1935, he had defected, so they, they had to get a replacement. Now, how they arranged this is beyond me, but sure enough, Von Braun came over here to replace Lay to work with Goddard for two years. However, what I found out was that he was working in a secret project at Los Alamos called P2, small p, large 2. This is probably the most controversial part about it. It's one thing to say uh, Werner Von Braun is present here uh, prior to uh, the war. Now uh, you're claiming that he's responsible for um, technology other than rocketry. Um, Just, uh, you see, none of the misinformation has mentioned any want to mention Von Braun in relation to flying saucers. Uh, however, the this Germans... Is where, this is yeah. where you divert in your book and uh, you explain how you feel that he, uh, he's very much involved in or had been very much I don't know whether Goddard knew about Von Braun's work on the flying saucer, whether he was privy to it or not, but it appears that he may have been uh, because the U.S. government apparently didn't trust Lay at that time because he wasn't employed by the government. He worked as a, as a writer. He was a talented, very talented, intelligent person. And uh, I don't know whether he's still writer. He could even still be alive. I don't know. But he had studied with Hermann Oberth also, and uh, who was the Hungarian rocket genius. But Goddard's rockets were outperforming all the German rockets, so they wanted to get what they could. 
that was the cover, but what they really wanted to do was test this flying saucer idea. 